those years, like my perspective shifted uh, from this like, you know, expectation and this like, you know, expectation of success and big league success and having a good career and anything less is a disappointment to this perspective of like, every day is a gift. Um, if I get to put it on, if I even get to put a jersey on again, boy, what a, what a joy that would be. Welcome to episode nine of the Back Pick Podcast. I'm your host, Brett Thomas. Today's guest is first overall pick in the 2013 Major League Baseball draft, Mark Appel. Mark talks about all he's been through in professional baseball from dealing with tons of injuries, expectations of being the number one overall pick, deciding to take a break from the game, all culminating in him making an incredible comeback and making his Major League debut just last year. Mark's very candid about everything he's been through. He talks about what became important to him and how he found his why. Something really important for, I think, youth players and coaches of youth players to tune into. Hope you enjoy. So you and I met, I was uh, a... a sophomore in junior college and I came back to coach uh, a high school team for my high school the school you attended Monta Vista and uh, I remember I'd been given a roster of guys and coach Piona at the end said hey there's this guy he's interesting he's kind of more of a basketball player um, <laughs> but I'd kind of like to see you know what could come of this right and so you know we had a great summer playing that group we had it was it was a lot of fun and then you know, it was like two years later, I'm at Cal and, and coach hubs, the pitching coach is like, Hey man, what do you got on Mark Appel? And I'm like, Oh, really good kid. And he's like, Oh really? I just saw him up to 95. And I was like, Oh, okay. So your, your ascent was, was pretty quick. Uh, you know, you kind of you know, very unknown when you got into high school and, and your development happened quick. Talk a little bit about that. A just physically what kind of happened and B how you kind of dealt with this kind of ascent into being coming a prospect pretty quickly. Yeah, um, you know, it, it's weird, like growing up in the in the East Bay, it's like, man, there's such a big talent pool out there. And so like, you feel like you compare yourself to the other kids and you're like, man, where do I stack up? This is, you know, I'm, I'm nobody, you know, you got guys that are committing to UCLA when they're freshmen. And, you know, I'm like, yeah, maybe I can go to college. I don't know. Um, and, and I think that's a reminder that just like everyone develops at a different pace and that everyone is kind of on their own, on their own track. And so that was something that, um, you know, it's funny, like the, I, I really, I think I got along with coach Piona pretty well at Monta Vista, but all, any of the arguments that we would have or any of the, you know, the issues that we would have centered around my love of basketball and trying to play basketball too, <laughs> because it always carried over into the baseball season. And so, you know, I'm like, I show up like three, four weeks late to, to the baseball season and I want innings and it's like, no, you haven't even been here. You know, uh, you've just been, you know, playing basketball. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's funny because I w I felt like I was like a multi-sport athlete and I never saw myself purely as a baseball player. I love pitching and I love playing baseball. Um, but basketball was a passion of mine too in high school and our team was really good. Um, you know, we want, we won NCS my senior year made it to the state championship. And, and that was a, that's an experience that I'll, I'll never forget. Like that's, you know, that was my last year ever playing competitive basketball. And, um, but I think all of that helped me, you know, on the field because I wasn't committed going into my, uh, well, going into my junior year, I wasn't committed. I wasn't even really on guys, radar teams, radars. Um, and probably that year I gained like three, four, five miles an hour. You know, I was working with, you know, uh, coaches like Jason Sakani at, at the pitching center, which is like the total player center now. And, uh, and just, you know, working with, with coaches in the area, because there's a lot of ex pro athletes that were giving back and pouring into, you know, the next generation of, of baseball players. And so I was part of that group. And a lot of my good friends came from just whether it's kind of doing these group lessons or, or playing on my high school team or the kind of the summer baseball circuits, um, you know, it was, it was really fun, but yeah, I was, I was really a late bloomer. Um, and it was, it was, it was really weird because it's like within probably six months, I went from getting, you know, a, a D one letter of just like, Hey, we saw you at this showcase and, you know, we're, you know, we're interested to getting an offer 
a few months later and then getting offers from like some big D1 schools because, you know, once I was able to get out there, um, you know, it's like, like we all know how the college recruiting can sometimes go. It's like you have the buzz prospects that haven't been signed. And then now everyone's like trying to go get them because they already got all their guys. So, but I was pretty, I was pretty unknown and unproven for a lot of colleges. You know, I, I only had 30 innings, my, my senior year of high school. Um, you know, we had probably four or five other D one pitchers on our, on our team. You guys were, you guys were loaded that year. That was such a good team, especially on the bump. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I tell people all the time, I'm like, we were 18 and eight, uh, but we had a team ERA of like 1.07. <laughs> we just had no offense yep, whatsoever. Yep. Like we lost like six games, one to nothing. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we had three Pac-12 pitchers, you know, and then a couple other D1s in California, like mid-major schools. Um, you know, one guy, Joey Wagman, who ended up going to Cal Poly, he pitched like three innings our senior year. And he was like the winningest pitcher in Cal Poly history. You know, <laughs> it's like, we, we had, we had a lot of, a lot of talent on the mound. Um, and so, you know, because of that, it's like, I just kind of got lost in the shuffle. It's like, I was never really seen as a guy. It's like raw could throw hard, but no one really expected, you know, me to turn into anything. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I'm glad you said that about, uh, being a multi-sport athlete, because, you know, I, I think it's very important and, you know, we are still in the, the world of development and, you know, we want guys here and we want them developing as best we can, but, you know, we make it, you know, a priority that if somebody says, Hey, you know, I'm going to take a couple months off because it's football season or it's basketball season. It's like, that's okay. Um, and I think it's important that guys realize coaches, players themselves, parents, that, that we don't have to specialize early and that really baseball can kind of become a little bit of a, a static game in the sense of doing one movement over and over and over again, that we got to remember that the athleticism in other sports is super important to our physical development. Big time, big time. I, I'm, I'm pro, especially for pitchers, I'm pro like multi-sport athlete because pitching is such a unique thing. It's like, like you said, you're just doing one movement over and over and over again. And you can easily lose some of the other athleticism that will, will help you, you know, throw harder, be more mobile, be stronger um, in a more dynamic way. Um, but, but I will say in the last 10 years, some of the specialization of youth athletes, especially in baseball, has been pretty, pretty unbelievable. Now, granted, I think there's been a higher increase of injuries and things like that. But the ones that are able to make it through – and they've had, you know, we've had 15, 20 years, just such a, a, a huge focus on development in a very specific way that like the training that youth athletes are getting nowadays is far better than what I was getting when I was in high school. And, uh, and you start to see it like this, you know, for example, this draft, like the draft class, everyone's talking about how talented everyone was like Skeens was the first overall pick. And I'm like, he was way better than. Like he had a way better year. He did way better stuff than I ever had, you know? Um, and, I, and we're and just I was, not even, what, we're 10 guy. years later. Right. I mean, it's yeah. like, it's not really not that long. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I anticipate, you know, we we're seeing guys in the big leagues now, you know, the, the average velo just keeps going up and up and up. And you see guys throwing one Oh four, one Oh five, one Oh six, like that, the closer for the twins Duran, like it's just unbelievable <laughs> stuff, you know? And I'm like, if anyone did that, 10 years ago, you know, it's like everyone talked about it. Like, and that was like a Chapman. He was the only guy that was doing something like that. And mm -hmm. now there's, you know, a handful of guys that are consistently sitting above a hundred and, you know, 10 years ago, that was insane. So, um, yeah, the games just developed so much and, um, it's, it's pretty fun to see as a guy who loves baseball, but I'm also like, I, you know, it's like, I, I'm, I'm at that age where I'm like, I don't think I'll be, ever be able to develop that, you know, and I've had a bunch of injuries and things like that. So, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty funny seeing it from kind of this side of my baseball career and like kind of near the end of it, um, you know, whether that's four or five years down the road or sooner or, or, or whatever it is. So, yeah, I just wish there was a little better, um, 
management of that work for youth athletes where it's like, to me, the, the model of a pro athlete is the best example, right? You, you have spring training and you ramp everything up. You play a six month season, you go into the fall, you take a little time off, rest the arm and you build it back up. And mm-hmm. right now you have these youth athletes that are playing super competitive tournaments or showcases in the fall. And then, you know, they're playing all the way through December and, and into January. And then their spring season starts in February. And you're like, well, when, when, when is the break that they need to stop? Maybe focus on some physical maturity, some mechanics, you know, things like that. What would you say if you were kind of giving uh, advice to a young pitcher that kind of that outline of what their, their year should look like, whether they're playing multi-sports or not? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. That's not something I've thought about too much. Um, you know, I think a six month season is a really long season. Um, and I, I, like, I don't think youth athletes should be playing competitively for probably six months straight right now. It's like, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, now, now obviously if you're limiting the workload, it's like ba- major league baseball is a six month season you're playing lit- I mean, basically, you get one off day every 10 days. Like, I don't know of any youth programs that are doing that, even the most elite travel ball teams. Um, Now, granted, you have like the double headers and the triple headers on the weekend and all that stuff, which is, which is wild. But Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I I think there needs to be like a a good rhythm. Um, You know, if your goal is to go to college, like maybe look at what, what college, you know, the college season looks like. It's like, all right, there's, there's kind of this fall ball, like training, you're, you're trying to ramp up a little bit. Um, you take a, a little break, a little, you know, two, three week break over the holidays. And then you're coming back in January and you're trying to ramp up again to get through the end of May. And then, you know, I think, I think like even playing in the summer, it's like, you do that. Like, I think it should be for fun. I think you should you, like lower, sh- you know, like lower stress, lower, like more emphasis on just enjoying the game and less emphasis on like trying to figure out, Oh, what's my future going to be and all this stuff. You know, it's like, even though that's always kind of in, in the background, you know, I think about like college summer ball. It's like, those were some of the most fun times I have had playing baseball, but in the background, we're thinking about pro ball. We're thinking about all of these other things yet in the moment, we're just like, Hey, we're just having fun. We're playing these games and, you know, things will happen as they're meant to happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I, 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 I knew my fall and winter from the perspective of basketball when I was in high school. And so Mm -hmm. I'm like, yes, I, I would still go to baseball, you know, practices, um, and like be a part of some of the team stuff. But I was like, I was doing basketball and, you know, that was kind of through the winter as playing, you know, playing sports, um, playing basketball. And so, um, and then just kind of doing the arm care management and throwing when I could. Um, And I saw like huge leaps of development, I think from basketball, because, you know, my cardio, my general fitness was, you know, way better than most of the other guys on my team. And so I could actually, you know, my nervous system was able to respond to the, the new inputs of playing a different sport much, much better than if I was just playing baseball the entire time, you know? Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I'm a big, I'm a big multi-sport kind of, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of like encouraging, you know, having, encouraging parents to put their kids in other sports if they're, if their kids are interested in that and want to do that. So. Yeah. I love the way you explain that too, in terms of just how your body's able to react differently because of the things that you've done, um, which is pretty cool. So you multi-sport athlete in high school, obviously get a chance to go to Stanford. I think it's interesting too, the, the draft process is something that guys, you know, really struggle with kind of understanding. You hope that they get the right people in their corner, but talk a little bit about you drafted three times. First time in high school, you know, was it just strictly like, Hey man, like I got a chance to get an education at Stanford, you know, that's, that's at the forefront or what was that decision-making process in terms of that? Yeah. I mean, Stanford is one of the more unique college experiences that any, anyone could get. I I felt very lucky to be able to even be committed to go to Stanford and that I got recruited. Like 
you know, my, my story, part of my story is I grew up in Houston and then we moved to California when I was going into seventh grade. So it's like, I think about if we didn't move and I just stayed in Houston, I would, I would have never been recruited by Stanford. So my geography played a huge role in that. Um, and, and then I just had a good, you know, summer camp. I went to the Stanford camp and pitched pretty well. And so, you know, they're like, yeah, we'll take a risk on, on this kid. this like tall, lanky basketball playing kid <laughs> from, from Danville. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it was, it was, um, yeah. Um, sorry. What was the, what was the question that you just kind of that, that decision-making process of like a With high the, school kid, like you're going to go play professionally or, or college. Yeah. I mean, it's eight, you're 18 years old. That's a, that's a really difficult decision, right? Yeah, it, it, it really is. Um, but I mean, for, for me, like I really wanted to go to Stanford. I was excited about it, you know, but um, I think the the phrasing we used with teams that were asking about my signability was like, hey, we think I think Stanford's a really unique opportunity. And if you think you can provide as unique of an opportunity with Pro Bowl, like sign me or like draft me and let's talk, you know. And um, but I think in general, most teams knew that I wanted to go to Stanford. And so, yeah, the Tigers picked me in the 15th round. Um, and what they told me was like, Hey, we, we kind of had you pegged as like a second rounder. Um, if you were signable, but we want, still wanted to, we still felt like it was worth it because if we couldn't sign some of our top picks, like we would really try to make a, make an effort to sign you. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, which, which was cool, but, but in, it was basically like, Hey, we like you, but hopefully we'll be able to draft you in, in a few years after you go to Stanford. Um, so, so talk about your time at Stanford. You played for obviously a legendary coach, uh, Mark Marcus, uh, mm -hmm. you know, obviously a little bit at the, at the end of his, I mean, anyway, he was there for 40 something years. I mean, you know, just an unbelievable career he had talk a little bit about playing for him. I think he was kind of, uh, old school as the game was kind of really changing. Um, what was that like playing for him and kind of his, his ability to kind of adjust with the new way of the game? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny with with the technological revolution, it feels like um, in the 80s and 90s and the internet and 2000s and all this stuff, it's like the game progressed pretty quickly. Um, but, you know, the, some, of, some of the tried and true methods of coaching uh, will always stay the same. Like the best coaches are uh, coaches that can help set the culture, that can um, teach disciplines that um, kids – of any era of any generation need. And, and coach Marquis did an incredible job of that. Um, you know, and, and so I would say, I would say from a life perspective, almost everyone that went through that program that played for coach Marquis became a better man, better person, better prepared to navigate, navigate the world once they left Stanford. Um, and, and so for that, I'm, I am incredibly grateful um, I think from, a you know, he had a different perspective on baseball from, uh, you know, a lot of, um, you know, that a lot of the players had coming in. And so I think I was kind of in that generation right near the end of his time at Stanford. Um, and, you know, I think there was just a, a, a difference in, in how a lot of the players would view things. Like I got along with Coach Marquis really, really well. Um, but he would, he was more, he, he focused more on like the position player side of things, defense and, and hitting and the approach to hitting. And, um, you know, and, and so like, we, I mean, we obviously had an incredibly talented team and we had a lot of success. And, and a lot of that was because he was a great recruiter and because he tried to get the most out of his players. Um, and so it, it's been, it's been really fun looking back on those years and having all the stories of, um, the stuff we, we didn't like and the stuff we absolutely loved and just getting to reminisce on, on all the wonderful moments, um, over, you know, my four years and, you know, all the other guys I played with. And, and then it's been fun to see what coach Esker has been able to do and how he's brought in kind of, uh, you know, a, it's like, it felt like we were more like pitching heavy and, and didn't really put up the offensive numbers. And now it's like completely flipped with Esker. Um, you know, it's like their offense has just been incredible the last couple of years. So, yeah, Esky, he legitimately knows how to develop hitters. I mean, when I, when I played with him, 
I mean, it was like always just training. And, and he's talked about this on our network before where it's like, you know, he's training hitters, not trying to be a swing coach, but like, here's everything you're going to see and go. And it's been cool from my perspective too, because I'm, I'm watching Stanford play and I'm like, man, I, I can see all the stuff that I know that he's implementing in practices and, and things yeah. like that, that's preparing those guys. But, you know, maybe they're a little more offensive heavy, but they got some, they got some pretty dang good arms too. And that's, what's made them really lethal over the last five years was the combination of the both. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, it, it's been, it's been really, really fun to watch, you know, um, we, we, I, I never, in my four years, I never got to go to Omaha. So anytime Stanford gets to go to Omaha, it's a big deal for a lot of us. Uh, especially some of the recent players. So, um, yeah, I mean, they're in, they're in really good hands with what Esker's doing, and hopefully they continue to have some success. Absolutely. Um, so. Yeah. So your second time you're drafted after, after your junior year. Um, again, more just like the process of this, and I think that uh, kind of how you navigated expectation – emotions like you're still playing you're still competing at Stanford and playing you get drafted you guys are are still you know even most of the time guys are still playing after they get drafted and you're kind of you still got you got finals you know everybody forgets it that you know you're an, a student as well as an athlete talk yeah. about just like navigating that process in terms of all this stuff on your plate as you as you're making these decisions yeah um man that was that was a, a strange year uh draft year you know i i had i had had a really good junior year and set myself up to be drafted pretty high um and then there's the first first year of the new draft rules and um you know kind of some unexpected things happen in the draft and and um and so i was like in the middle like from my own perspective i'm ecstatic about trying to play pro ball ecstatic that i'm drafted in the first round uh i'm also in the middle of you know we have we're getting ready to go to play Florida state in the super regionals. We have, um, you know, finals that same weekend. And so, so I'm like, all of this stuff is coming at me all at once. And, and that's a lot for, you know, a, a 20 year old kid who's, you know, still figuring out, you know, life and how, how to do things and hasn't really been in the real world. Um, so yeah, life's kind of came at me pretty quick, um, there for a little bit. Um, but, I mean, I'm, I'm really grateful for that opportunity. Like, I feel like it really helped me, you know, make some, some like hard decisions and to learn how to live with the consequences of making a decision and, and trying to make the most of the decisions, knowing that like, you're never going to be able to do something perfectly, you know, so, and there's pros and cons and all of this other stuff. But as long as you have peace about the decision that you make and, and you don't complain about the consequences then it's like, go, go make the decision you want to make. Um, I always believed when that went hap you know, when that went down with you, I, I always knew just knowing you even a little bit was you had a lot of belief in yourself. And I yeah. think that's a lot of times, you know, that we, and th look, this is as life lesson as it gets. Right. I mean, I've started multiple businesses and I can tell you that like I start a business with an idea and it's difficult to sleep at night because you're kind of sitting there second guessing yourself and these, these decisions that you make in life, you have to live with. But at the end of the day, you're just literally being like, no, man, like you are doing what's right. You can do this. And I just believe that was probably a lot of what went through your head in that whole process. Yeah. And, and honestly, you know, I, faith has been a huge part of my life. And so, you know, I kind of see things a little bit differently. Like money's obviously incredibly important for, you know, for everyone to get through life and all that stuff. But um, it's like, I, I cared more, I care more about like relationships, about developing skills, about education, things like that. So like, because I'm like, if you have those things, it's like, it's going to be easier to provide for yourself later in life. And so I, I saw, I put a really high value on being back for my senior year, um, knowing that like professional baseball would still be there. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of a strange situation. A lot of unexpected things happened. And then I made a decision based on kind of whatever was presented to me and, and stuck with it. Um, and, you know, I knew that like, all I wanted to do was get better. Um, I've always, I've always believed that like the more we just stay in our lanes, focus on our roles 
and try to increase our skills, develop ourselves as baseball players, like then good things will happen. Like we'll be able to figure out where we go. But a lot of times we focus on the peripherals. We focus on comparing ourselves with other guys in our class or, or whatever it may be. And that removes our focus from like actually getting work done and developing yourself as a better player, you know? And, um, and so that's, that was my focus. I'm like, well, I was like, I don't really care where I am next year. It's like, I could be in the pirates organization or I could be back at Stanford. And my goal is the same. It's just to try to keep getting better. And ultimately I just decided I wanted to keep getting better at Stanford um, for a lot of reasons, finishing my degree, being, being a, you know, a team captain, be, having influence on the Stanford team, um, having another chance to go to Omaha. I mean, that was a, that was a big deal. Like if you haven't played college baseball, you know, at a big school, um, it's like, you probably won't get how, how much fun it would be to go to Omaha. Um, and all the guys that did get to go to Omaha, like it's one of those moments that you're like, I'm going to take this with me for the rest of my life. You know, it's a big deal. And so I wanted to have another chance. And even though we didn't do it, I don't regret having that, that last chance to try to get to Omaha. Absolutely. Absolutely. And obviously worked out next year. You're, you're drafted first overall to, I mean, I assume your, your hometown team, right? I mean, you grew up an yeah. Astros fan, right? Uh, yep, that's right. So, so pretty cool there. Now let's talk about you getting into pro ball and you're the number one overall pick. Obviously, you know, there's, you know, no higher expectations than that. Uh, talk about navigating now. This is a job, and you know you have been you know tabbed as as the future of this organization. Talk a little bit about how you dealt with that. Uh, the, obviously, the the just lifestyle of pro ball. I think that enough people don't really talk enough about and the difficulties of that, and just navigating the expectation that came with being the number one overall pick. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think when I look back at my time with the Astros, the way I describe it is like I, I did the best I could with what I had, with what was presented to me. And and because of that, like I I, I have a lot of grace for for myself and all the things that I went through. Um, you know, there was there was a crazy amount of external expectation, but also like the internal expectation. It's kind of how I'm wired is that I, I want to have good relationships with people. Um, I'm kind of a people pleaser. And so it's like, man, I, I wanted to be able to, um, you know, to do whatever was being asked of me without complaining, without grumbling. And I tried to do that the best I could. Um, and it was, it was hard because I was starting to feel physical issues, like some pain and in, in my elbow and things like that. Um, and, and, from that through, you know, I mean, there are so many factors, but it's just like dealing with uh, the the failure and the struggle that happened, seemed to happen so immediately after I got, you know, I, I was like highest of highs. And then a year later, I'm lowest of lows. I've got a 10 ERA and an A ball in the Cal League. And um, yeah, it, it was just like a very confusing time in my life. I showed up every day. I worked hard. I gave my best. Um and, and it, it just seemed like I couldn't get things to click. And, and then my, my elbow started bothering me and now I'm trying to fight through, you know, it, there's just like nagging injury. It's not so bad that I need to stop throwing, but it's not good enough to where I, I can like feel like I'm throwing with confidence. And I mean, there are just, it just felt like it was one thing after another. Um, and I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't have the skills um, to figure out how to, you know, stop the bleeding per se and kind of hit the reset button and figure out how to get back on track. Um, and looking back, I'm like, maybe that would have been having surgery a little bit sooner to try to deal with the bone spurs that were, were, you know, cropping up or, you know, that, that had been developing over the years. And, um, yeah, you know, there, there's a lot of things that I'm like, maybe I would have done things a lot differently, but I'm not mad that I didn't because, I, I just didn't have the information available that I do now as I'm looking back. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was hard. It was, it was a hard, but also really like, um, it really developed me. Uh, and I think strengthened me in a lot of other ways 
even though it felt like, man, my, my baseball career is not going how I ever wanted it to go or expected it to go or, or anyone else for that matter. Um, and so just being able like having to own the failure, uh, is, is, is really hard, especially when you, you care a lot about performing well and, and you have performed well a lot in, in the past. Um, I to learn how to do that. Talk a little bit about that. I don't think you said that great uh, people pleaser because, you know, I think a lot of us are like that. Um, I definitely find myself to be like that at times, but I think, you know, now that you've added a lot of the social media aspects with kids and, and their development, that they're kind of like, you know, trying to please the masses of people through social media. Talk yeah. about how you've navigated that, just how you were that way and, and kind of how you navigated dealing with that uh, to try to figure out what was actually best for you through this. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I kind of learned by being thrown into, into the waves, you know, into the fire, uh, like after I was drafted my junior year, um, you know, and then I decided to go back, it's like social media, a lot of fans in Pittsburgh really had an issue with that. You know, they felt like I, I spurned their team. I, you know, by not signing with the pirates after they drafted me that I, I just, you know, it was like a, an, an insult to the city of Pittsburgh, which is the furthest thing from, if you know me, like what I would do or like what I care about, you know, it's like, I, 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 I care about people. I, I love people. Um, you know, I, I love hearing stories of people from all different walks of life. It's like relationships matter a whole lot to me. And so, you know, it's funny how me just making a decision to return to Stanford for my senior year um, prompted such outrage. And, and so on social media, it's like I learned that I tried to do the best, make the best decisions I could um, with a pure intentions, yet people interpreted it and received it in a really negative way. And there was literally nothing I could do to change their mind unless I maybe spent the time and sat down with each and every person that was ticked off by me going back to school and had a long conversation and broke bread with them so that they could get to know me, then maybe, and even then, maybe they're just like, you're, you know, you're just full of yourself or like, I don't believe anything that you're saying or, or whatever. And so I had to learn the hard way of just being like, all right, uh, you know, I can't live my life for the sake of making other people happy. That, but, but sometimes we get to that point and we say, well, then screw it. I'm just going to tick everyone off and I'm not going to listen to anyone. And I'm just going to be me and do me. And that's it. Right. It's like this hyper individualism. We're like, and, and I don't think that's the answer either. You know? So it's like, we can't, we can't bow down to everyone but we, we also don't want to make enemies with everyone. And like, there's this middle road that what I think navigating life, especially as a baseball player, a young player in social media is being sincere and having your moral convictions and living by those and, but not abandoning, you know, people are just cutting people off if they don't agree with you, but having good conversations because some of the most like some of the biggest leaps in development I made were when coaches or other people actually had disagreements with me. They're like, Hey, you're doing something uh, your way. And I think if you do it differently, you actually might be better, but that comes from a place of trust in relationship. And you have to have trust in order to listen to what someone is saying, because if someone just criticizes without, you know, having that trust, like you're going to take that and you say, they just don't believe in me. And they, they're just trying to change me. Um, you know, and I dealt with that even with some coaches when I was with the Astros, they, I had coaches that they never took the time to develop the trust. They just expected trust because they were the coach and they would give me all of these things to change when they never took the time to get to know me or develop a relationship with me so that I, like, I would be an opening ear or I would have an, an open ear and be really receptive to the changes that they want to make, you know? And, and then the issue that I had was that I wanted to please them. So I would try to make the changes without believing in the changes because we never had that relationship. And, 
And, you know, I felt like, okay, well, maybe it's my job to make them trust me because, and I, I will essentially bow down to their wishes, even though I feel like what they're asking me to do is actually hurting me. And that, that's a really tough place to be. I mean, I got to see Ken Revisa speak at the ABCA convention a, a long time ago. And, you know, they just literally is stuck with me forever. You know, people have to know you care before they care what you know. And yeah. it's like, it's like one of the most massive things that I think coaches overlook. Um, and that's where a lot of times when I'm training coaches that I've got, you know, yeah, this guy, he's, you know, he doesn't listen to this and that. And, you know, it becomes like, what, what do you know about him? Why, what do you, what do you think makes him that way? You know? And it's like, if you dig a little deeper and, and start to get to know them and build that trust, it's super important. And, you know, obviously you're dealing with that in pro ball and you can imagine that at the youth levels, a lot of people are not equipped to be able to do that. And we end up being psychologists yeah. a little bit here. And, um, so it's great to hear you say that and that experience that you're dealing with even at the highest levels. And, um, you obviously your, your time with the Astros was then, uh, you know, cut short, you got traded, um, in, I think 2015. Mm -hmm. And, um, so talk about a little bit of, of, that i mean a just being traded in general what does that mean you know why am i being traded uh and then the uh, you know adopting of a new organization in the phillies yeah yeah i i i mean the trade was definitely a shock to me um as i think it was to a number of different people um but i think that, that there there were a lot of things you know the astros were getting really close to trying to be competitive and try to go to the playoffs again um they needed a, a kind of a, a reliever, um, kind of back into the bullpen kind of guy. And, you know, the Phillies wouldn't give up Ken Giles unless, uh, you know, I was a, I was a part of the package. And so, you know, that, that's a, that's a kind of behind the scenes look into like the business side of this, you know, it's like, you know, you, you, you want to have loyalty to an organization, to the people, the, the fans, um, you know, and, and you live your life that way. And then all of a sudden in a moment, you're like, all right, well now I'm no longer part of that organization. I'm part of a new one. Um, and so, you know, it, it was, it was an interesting, it was an interesting time because if you look back, you know, that was right before the 2016 season. And when I was with the Phillies, I only played two more years and I was hurt almost both, you know, almost the whole time, both of those years. And then I was, I was done playing. And, and so I think the Phillies wanted, you know, I think they thought that change of scenery might be a good thing for me, but I had other issues beneath the surface that still needed to be addressed. Like my, my elbow, uh, having issues, having bone spurs. And I had surgery in 2016 for that. And then through kind of the stuff I was feeling in my elbow, I was compensating and starting to develop some pain in my shoulder, uh, which eventually I had surgery on my shoulder too. And so um, yeah, it, it was, I was, by the end of the 2017 season, I was, I was like really, really burnt out. Um, cause it felt like performance just wasn't there. Um, my focus was on just trying to feel like I could even throw a ball and not be in pain. Um, and it's really hard to get guys out when you're kind of in that mindset and in that place. And so, um, I, I needed a break and I needed, eventually I needed surgery. Um, but even then I wasn't even sure i wanted to keep playing baseball by that point um so when you so. say you took that break was it you know like when you you, you retired in, in early in 2018 and was that idea of like i'm done or was it like i just need to kind of regroup here a little bit i uh i wasn't sure um i wasn't sure but what i what i what i told myself is like i need to make a decision to not live my life thinking about baseball every day. And so what, what that meant was like, I stopped working out. I stopped throwing, I stopped, you know, like there's this like, you know, unwritten unsaid belief that most baseball players have. It's like, if I'm not doing something today, if I'm not being productive, if I'm not getting my work in, then I'm falling way behind. Right. I'm, you know, and it's, it's like, you're, you're working just to keep up instead of like, confidently walking in development and, and knowing you're like, Hey, I'm, I am at the, you know, I am in a place where it's like, I'm actually getting better versus like, I feel like I'm, I'm struggling to keep up. And I think most players feel like they're struggling to keep up. There's such a, 
an emphasis on, oh, you got to stick to the program every single day. And if you aren't sticking to the program, then like you're actually getting worse in some way. And it, it creates a lot of anxiety and it creates this, this like, you know, never ending cycle that is, is actually, I think, really detrimental to, to a lot of kids. And so I was kind of in that place. I was like, man, I'm injured, but I feel like I need to be able to compete tomorrow. And there was no, there was no gap for rest, recovery, you know, patience, um, time and age is such a huge factor when it comes to baseball. Oh, I did this. I mean, that's true of life too. It's like, I, I did this by this age. I was, you know, in this, at this level of pro ball by this age, I made my debut at this age. Um, Cause it doesn't just affect how much money you make, but it also is part of like your legacy about who you are and all this stuff. And so um, there's so many things where age is such a factor. It's like, you see all of the, posts on social media that MLB makes is like they're talking about how the amazing things these young players are doing at such a young age. Right. But it's like, they don't talk about, you know, like Mike Trout isn't getting the nod because he's doing this at, you know, 31 or 32 years old. You know, he got the nod a lot back when he was doing it at 21 and 22, Mm -hmm. you know, for sure. So, so that, I mean, that was, that was, that was part of it, but I just needed to take a break and get my mind off of baseball. And so I lived life as if I'd never play baseball again. I, I, I knew that maybe in the back of my mind, it's like, who knows? I, I guess I can leave the door open, but that's true at any point in my life. And so it's like, I, I just, I, I was like, I, I think I'm done with baseball and I need to live my life as if I'm done with baseball and figure out who, who's Mark Appel, the person not the baseball player where this doesn't define me in any way. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. It is, the, it is the best thing that I ever did. Yeah. Well, and again, we we stick to these labels so often, you know, uh, Mark Appel, baseball player, Mark Appel, number one overall pick, you know, Mark Appel, all these expectations. And it's like, at what point in time, and this is what I talk to the kids about too. At what point in time do you really know who you are and what your reasoning is for being here? And what's your why on, what you want to do. And yeah. you have all this expectation, you know, this is why I've asked you so much about expectation. Cause these kids feel so much expectation of I'm a sophomore. I'm not committed yet. Why I'm a junior. I'm not committed yet. Why I'm a senior. How do I navigate this now? And there's so much expectation. It's like, well, you're, you're just strictly identifying as a baseball player and you need yeah. to understand that there's way more to you. Uh, tell me a little bit about in that time you had off, what'd you kind of figure out about that and, and how that cleared your mind a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I figured out that, um, I love being around my family. I figured out that, um, that people like me, uh, for me and not just because I play baseball. Um, I mean, these are things that you're like, well, duh, like Mark, you, you seem like a good guy, you know? Um, but they're like insecurities, you know? And it's like, I mean, how many kids think that their parents love them because they're pursuing this, this, you know, sport. Um, and if that they're afraid that if they were to stop, that they might not be receiving the same love, um, because, uh, it's a big sacrifice that parents make to let their kids go play baseball and, and a lot of times it starts from this place of love and it, it morphs into this like expectation and, um, you know, kind of rooted in shame. It's like, there's disappointment if, you know, you don't play well, or there's disappointment if you are tired and you're like, Hey, maybe I don't want to keep playing baseball, but you feel like you have to keep going because you want to make mom and dad happy, you know? Um, and so, so I, I, le- I just learned that people like me for nothing that I can give them or n- no life that they can live vicariously through me and my career. Um, and that was a big deal. You know, I, I, I traveled a little bit. I, I, you know, went on trips with friends and, um, you know, I, I was back and, you know, going to church on a regular basis, which was a big part of my life, uh, growing up and, um, you know, it's like, I just, I was just able to figure out who I am. You know, I had a lot of time to explore other hobbies and passions and other things like that. And, you know, I figured out some things I really like and some things I don't like at all, but I got to experience it. I got to go try it. And 
And there's, that was like a huge thing for me to, when I actually went back and started playing again or trying to play again, I did it because it's like, I, I actually wanted to, and I enjoyed it. I didn't feel obligated or feel like this expectation was con- making me continue to go, um, you know, longer than, than I should have. Um, and then obviously it culminated in a great story last year with you getting a chance to, to get called up and, and make your debut in the big leagues. And I mean, that was, uh, you know, I mean, I getting emotional, even just thinking about it. I watched, I was going through your Twitter, you know, a couple of days ago and, you know, you reposted it and, uh, I mean, what a cool moment. And again, just knowing all that you've been through, um, it's one of those moments that I just, it needs to be spoken about and said, because the reason it's so special is because of how difficult it was for you to get there. And so many times, none of these kids want to uh, deal with the adversity and understand that everything is better when you had to battle to get to it. So tell me a little bit about that moment. You finally get out there and, and you get a chance to, to fulfill your dream, pitching in the big leagues. Yeah, it was special. Um, I mean, yeah, I get, I get emotional thinking about it too. Uh, there, were, there were years where I thought, you know, that dream had died, like it would never happen. Um, and getting to experience it was, was like a shock, you know, it was a surprise, you know, for so long you expected it. And then something happened in those years where I was away and going through, you know, I was, I stopped playing baseball for a year. Then, then I had surgery and then I was doing Mm -hmm. rehab for two and a half more years. And in those years, like my perspective shifted uh, from this, like, you know, expectation and this, like, ex- you know, expectation of success and big league success and having a good career and anything less is a disappointment to this perspective of like, every day is a gift. Um, if I get to put it on, if I even get to put a Jersey on again, boy, what a, what a joy that would be, you know? Um, and, and so when I got, when I got called up, it was like, one of the most overwhelming and emotional times that I got, ex- I got experience with me and, you know, with my family. And, um, it was, yeah, it was just really, really special. Um, and so, um, I, and like I said, you know, and like we've been talking about, it's like the difficulties that you go through make it more special, you know? And, um, and my perspective would have been totally different in life if I never went through some of those, things. Maybe you know, I'd like to think I'd try to still be doing good if I had a really good career and all that stuff. Um, but it's like my story connects with uh, this generation of kids or, or the, at least this large group of people that feel like they're misunderstood or they have had these struggles that it seems like everyone else that they're looking at, you know, that is success. And we, we love to put a put people that have had really successful careers on a pedestal and try to break down exactly why that happened and what worked well. Um, so they get to see my story and they're like, Oh, it's not always a a straight line. It's not always just like one thing after another, after another. And, um, and that like, I can find, you know, maybe myself and Mark's story a little bit and, and, and I can hopefully start to be thankful for all the little things that I have today, you know? realizing that it's like, man, every, every day is a gift. Every day is a gift. And like, you never know, you know, I, I never know what, what day my last day of playing baseball will be. But the same is true. It's like, life is fragile. It's like, you know, we have, we have family members, friends, like you never think anything's going to happen. And then one day they're gone. And it's like, it's just a reminder. It's like, man, as long as we have breath in our lungs, um, it's like we we have we have incredible opportunity to live well and to enjoy all the little things that we've been given, um, and and that perspective absolutely changed the way that I approach baseball. But I think it also just made me a better player. And so you know, for 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 kids that are thinking about this and feeling so much weight and pressure and anxiety and all of these things, it's like taking a step back and asking yourself, like, if it was all over today, would I be happy? And if you aren't, then maybe that's something that you should spend more time thinking about and talking about with either your teammates or your coaches or your parents or things like that. Um, Because there's way more to life than just getting to play baseball. And I actually think that 
when you have gratitude for the day, when you, when you see every day as a gift, as an opportunity, um, then you're, you're actually going to play better and have more success and have way more fun too. Um, so yeah, last year was a special year. It's also is a great story. And you know, what you're doing now on Twitter. Um, and I gotta tell you, I, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, genuine it's thoughtful it's vulnerable which i think is a very important thing um and you know just you being honest about what's gone on in your life and and explaining that to people and and people being able to like you said hear your story maybe take some something from it is phenomenal and uh, i appreciate that you do that and now you have uh, you're trying to even take it even further and mentoring uh some young kids tell me a little bit about that what you're doing in terms of just trying to help some younger athletes yeah, I, you know, the last couple months have been a little tough for me. You know, I, I went from playing on, you know, a championship baseball team with the Phillies last year uh, to being hurt and released in spring training. And now I'm back home. And all of a sudden that change of like expecting to be playing every day and gearing up for that and all the activity and all the travel and all that stuff. And now I'm just stuck at home. I'm rehabbing, you know, I'm, I'm still doing stuff, but I'm like, I have so much time and I found myself restless a little bit. And, um, I always go back to like something my basketball coach in high school always said, it's like, we would be running, you know, suicides on the, on the court. And at a certain point, everyone's kind of dying. Like, it's like, but you got to get back on the line. Like you got to keep going. And he, he would always say, it's like the best thing you can do to get back on the line is help someone get back on the line you know, and, and, and so it's like just the act of helping someone else is also something that can help you. Um, and, and I think about that often and, and I think it, it's promoted, like it's developed this, this heart to serve others. Um, and, and something that I'm still figuring out what that looks like practically, but I, I kind of made a decision a couple of weeks ago. I was like, you know what, every time that I would write something, I got, countless dms from high school or college kids that were like i'm dealing with the same thing like can you talk on the phone can you you know can you give me some sort of tips or insights or whatever it's like kids kids are looking for a listening ear from someone who's been there um and so i just set up like an online schedule and had this application process to kind of vet and just like filter through make sure that kids actually wanted it and wasn't just their parents filling it out so I'm not trying to charge anything. I'm not trying to like make money off of this. I just want to help people. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I've probably met with like 15 kids over the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, and it's dealing with guys dealing with injuries, guys dealing with like college recruiting issues and like, what can I do to get seen more and, and, you know, and kind of bring their focus on today and the work that they're doing and um, just trusting that, and coaches are going to be able to find you if you if you're good enough. So keep developing your skills and um, dealing to there's just the anxieties that high schoolers have in the day to day life of you know of going to school and the social scene and and all of that stuff. It's like there's just a lot that kids go through, um, but all of them like want to keep playing baseball and they want to keep you know extending their career as long as they can and and to find peace and joy in the midst of it. And so it's been really fulfilling to just to get to hear these kids' stories and then, you know, answer their questions and try to give any piece of advice that I can. And, you know, I, I opened it up a couple of days ago. I was just invited other, see if any other minor league baseball players wanted to like give back and help younger kids. And already a couple of them have reached out to me and said, hey, I know I don't have a lot of time, but if there's anything I can do to help. And so, you know, it's like, I'm like, man, it's like there there's, it's really cool to see just the community uh, of people that have gone through things and saying, you know what, like, I think I've earned some sort of wisdom that might be able to help other people. And instead of keeping that to myself, I'm just, I want to, I want to give back. I want to actually help kids as they're going through life. And so um, it's been, it's been great. It's been really cool. And I, I have no idea what, what will come of it um, or how long I'll be able to do it or, you know, whether it's something that I can continue to do for, you know, the rest of the season or, or even longer. Um, but for now it's been, it's been really, really cool. Well, I mean, just, you know, as a, as a advocate for youth athletes, I think thank you is just 
you know, everything that you're doing is, is awesome. And again, I think the biggest key is, is the vulnerability and, and you just getting out there and talking about what's going on and, and kids knowing that, Hey, it's okay that I'm not doing it right now. And I don't feel great. Yeah. And, you know, I'm frustrated. And so I uh, thank you for all you're doing on, online. I, I hope anybody that's listening, you know, please follow Mark. I'm assuming just at Mark Appel. Yeah. It's, uh, I think it's at Mark Appel 26 on, you know, on Twitter and Instagram. Um, I don't post, you know, like on a regular schedule or whatever, but, um, you know, I try to try to add value whenever I do. And, and then, you know, one of the things that I've really enjoyed doing is just writing. Um, and so I, I have like a, it's like a blog slash newsletter. So like you can get it in your emails. Um, and you can, you can, you can subscribe to that on my website, markopel.com. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I try to be a pretty open book, uh, pretty straightforward kind of guy. I'm not trying to, you know, get you to buy products or <laughs> all these other things. For sure. I just, I just want to add value to people's lives. Um, just by sharing the stories of the things that I've been through and maybe start sh- sharing stories of what other people have been through as well. It's awesome, man. I, I again, highly recommend anybody listening to uh, sign up for that newsletter. It's super thoughtful, genuine, exactly what youth athletes and, and coaches of youth athletes need. So um, Mark, man, I, I can't even tell you, this was so incredible. Uh, I just, there's so much that athletes and coaches of athletes are going to take from this. Um, and I, your time is, is valuable and I truly appreciate you being on here. Yeah. It's, it's been, been a pleasure. I'm glad we were able to make it happen. It's good. Good to see you again. I know. Been a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Wishing you the best of luck, man. All right. Thanks, Brad. If you enjoyed that, be sure to like and subscribe. We'll have a new episode for you every single Tuesday here on our YouTube channel and wherever you listen to podcasts.